Thanks for coming this morning. I know we got all we got busy schedules, but I'm so glad you're able to come and to, 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 to listen at least to the total town piece. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, John Austin here in a second with John. I had the, had the privilege to work with John many, many years ago. Uh, in the area, we worked and then he went on the service uh, on the state part of education, selected in, and so he's, he's all of these doing some great work for the state of Michigan. So, but I uh, heard this presentation. I'm part of Michigan College Access Network. Uh, I'm on the board. Uh, Brandon Johnson leads the effort uh, statewide, and I know John and Chris are working with her with his efforts. But um, I heard a presentation about the economy and about skills gaps and all that stuff in Lansing. And so I invited them over to share the information with us to talk a little bit about the state the economy and, and job skill challenges, if you will, and to look at the West Michigan area and try to take a deeper dive and just share the information with us. And because obviously we're all about making sure we, as an institution, help close the skill traps here in West Michigan. So um, I'm going to invite you up and John to introduce Chris. You all for, for being here. Um, John and I were talking. I knew I knew Dr. Selman for a long time, but I we both forgot like where and when we first met. And it was over in Flint. I was leading this group called the Flint Roundtable, which was our civic business and education leaders around how do we get more people in Tennessee County a better education. And John was were you running the Detroit College of Business yeah. right, on that group? It's like okay, we got it. Um, and if you were coming here because you saw Brandy Johnson, the director of MCAN. Uh, was going to be speaking. I hope you don't run away right away because she isn't here, but she sends her greetings. She, her second child was born with a cleft palate without an ear and they were doing some surgery to adapt her mouth. She had a little bit of a crisis last week um, uh, and is now coming out and is out of the hospital, so Brandy's got to be home. Um, but I really want to first you know, applaud your work here and all of the different roles that you play in this important work of helping more of our people get the life-changing opportunity of a great education and a higher education, which is what we're gonna talk about today, to have the skills and be able to navigate in what is a very changing, fast-changing um, uh, labor market uh, and get what they need to succeed and be able to get a job and keep a job and raise a family. And I know that's your work and I just wanna thank you for that and thanks for coming out on a Friday morning. Um, I'm gonna do the first bit, which is this sort of updated agenda for how do we as a state of Michigan help more of our people achieve uh, higher levels and needed levels of post-secondary credentials and degrees of all forms in all fields where we uh, need them to have that kind of preparation and I'll sort of detail why. Chris Tremblay, who's now the, um, what's your official title? The number two at MCAN, uh, the Director of uh, Outreach External Engagement. Chris, uh, meet Chris, if you haven't met Chris. Um, He's never been to Muskegon Community College before. Um, I've been here about 500 times. Uh, probably get sick of me. Sometimes I'm over here selling the blue economy. I think last year I keynoted the Community Foundation had their big annual meeting and they used it to announce the child savings account, which you all put together here, which is wonderful. And I used that as an opportunity to say, good on you, but also here's a community that is organizing around education, higher education, and all the steps in that road as as their future and the future for your people and the future for your community. Just like Kalamazoo did kind of famously with the promise, we need to mark our communities as places where we build and develop the talent. So I'm gonna do the kind of statewide opening salvos and Chris is gonna come in and, and talk about how we're performing as a state but also show you some data from your local communities, this three county area, right? Uh, that hopefully will spur additional conversation uh, about how you all can continue to organize around the goal here. Um, we have funding from various foundations who care about helping people get a better education. Um, the Michigan Higher Education Roundtable uh, has been together for a few years. It really is a, a coming together of what we first did way back under Governor Granholm. She charged a Lieutenant Governor's Cherry Commission, uh, which was again, this was in 94, no 2004, 2004-5 that I was the policy director of, but it was our community college leadership and our university leadership and our business leaders and labor leaders. And she challenged that commission to say, we need to help more Michiganders get a post-secondary credential or degree and leverage our great learning institutions, community college and universities for economic growth. And, you know, high school 
diploma doesn't get you traction anymore. We need to raise the bar. And out of that effort, that was 12 years ago, came some of the future things. Uh, uh, the, the exit requirements for high school, the Michigan Merit Curriculum. Uh, we had a no worker left behind effort that uh, we had a Michigan Merit Scholarship to pay for college. We had the birth of the college access networks of which many of you uh, that Brandy then took and, and grew with your help. Uh, we had so many of the puzzle pieces, more early dual enrollment and, and uh, expanded efforts at improving transfer and acceptance between universities and community colleges. And that was 12 years ago. Some of those things went away when people defunded them. But three or four years ago, we came together these organizations, which are sort of the same stakeholders in how we as a state prepare people with post-secondary credentials and degrees. And we said, how are we doing and how can we do better? Uh, and we published a report and we began to work together on a roadmap. I mean, Michigan's higher education system, there is no one system. It's all decentralized. The community colleges are on their own bottom, the universities. So the only way we can make headway is to come together and agree to work on some priorities together and collaborate uh, on shared strategies. And that's what this is really all about. So we brought this group back together. Uh, in recent years, we've seen some of the fruits of this collaboration. We've reintroduced uh, career development and planning into K-12 again. Again, we always work with whoever is in charge of the state, the governor administration. Um, We've improved uh, training for, on college and career guidance for our counselors. We've added some capacity, not nearly enough, in terms of numbers of guidance and career counselors uh, through the public-private efforts. The career navigators that just passed as part of the Marshall Plan add some additional resources towards that. Um, we have increased participation, again, not nearly enough, but in all forms of very powerful, anytime high school students begin to participate in and take college or post-secondary credits uh, it's an accelerant for them. It guarantees that they're more likely to earn a credential. So early college, middle colleges, uh, concurrent enrollment, dual enrollment, early AP and IB programs, all are powerful. We've expanded, and CTE programs, expanded CTE, which is a, usually these days it means you got to take that next step into community college uh, on that path. So they're well articulated. We've, the universities and community colleges, and John, I'm sure you all are into this, Part of how do we as institutions make sure people don't just show up and drift around, but they earn a credential or degree? Uh, because if they do, they, they can get traction in the world and the labor market. If they don't, and they just waste their money, uh, so guided pathways, more mentoring. I'm sure this institution is a leader in, as many of the community colleges are, how do we help more people complete, whatever it takes, uh, a, a degree or credential? And how do we improve the guidance and the transfer acceptance so that your package of um, community college courses, as so many people are now moving on to get a baccalaureate, that those credits are accepted, people aren't wasting time and money, uh, that they are able to move seamlessly, efficiently, uh, and so the universities and community colleges and independents have been working to grease that transfer acceptance uh, program, uh, important contributor to having more people move towards and earn a post-secondary credential or degree. Uh, we've strengthened and extended the kind of data, CEPI, on performance of K-12 and higher ed so we can look at how people are doing or where they go different institutions uh, and we can make better decisions. And in the finally, I mean, the Snyder administration, I think we've been working with them, they wanted to get to talent more robustly for several years, um, but they, you know, Flint happened and Detroit schools crisis. Jeff Hansen from out here was actually you know, famously trying to do something really constructive for Detroit schools. That, that preoccupied lots of people for a long time. Finally, in the last year or two, they've, they've turned to talent and you see some of the um, Marshall Plan elements, career navigators, adult training scholarships, some engagement of the business community to shape uh, career technical programs largely, enhanced career technical to trades. That's come along. But we, and we made progress since that Cherry Commission time. Uh, then we were like 32% of our people have a post-secondary credential or degree. Uh, we're now up to 44% of our population in Michigan have some form of valuable post-secondary credential degree certificate. Uh, we got a big bump when we learned to count certificates that you earn at the sub-associates level. So that's cheating a bit. But we made headway. Uh, however, and, and the local rates that Chris baked in here, 
you can see Muskegon County, Nuego County, Oceana County. Nuego is green, Oceana is blue, Muskegon is red. You can see some HUDway, actually some downturn. We got to figure out what that is. Is that a is that a um, um, an error in, in how we count, or is that something real? So this is just exposing for you all information that may help you wrestle with how you're performing and what do you do about it. Um, but you know, we as a state, we're nowhere near where we need to be. This shows the high income states over here, is over there, and the, the, share of, the share of bachelor's degree and higher is over there and income is up here. And you can see Michigan's way down in the southwest corner, not where you want to be. The, the states that attract, keep, and prepare their own people to higher levels of post-secondary learning and education are the most prosperous. They have the high incomes. I mean, it's a direct correlation. So um, we have to move, and so we're not even near the top 10. Uh, and the high flyers have 60% of their people with a post-secondary degree, credential, or certificate. Uh, that's where we need to get if we want to have a thriving economy, if we want to be the state that's rocking and rolling uh, again. So this is an urgent challenge, this talent building agenda. Now, how do we understand this talent building agenda? Well, as you all know, because you work in this field, the, the world is changing so fast that the skill demands and the education and training demands are, are accelerating uh, tremendously. So what this shows is there, there are lots of jobs being created since the recession, but the red line is all the jobs, 8.4 million, that require a bachelor's degree or higher. An associate's degree or higher, you see 3.1 million jobs have been created. But there ain't no jobs for people with a high school education. Certainly no good jobs. Uh, only, so 99% of the jobs created since the Great Recession, which we felt intensely here, have required a post-secondary credential advanced education beyond high school. Um, that's the part of the change of the, the labor market. We also see there's, there's lots of occupations that are you know, at risk already or already automated out of existence. I mean, think of retail sales or travel agents or sales clerks. I mean, you're doing all that yourself now. So low-skill jobs are at tremendous risk, and we have more people in Michigan out there in the labor market with just a high school degree. Um, there's a 70% chance that those folks' jobs today are going to be obliterated. Uh, if you're in a high school job with high levels of formal education, less likely that job's going to disappear. But also, you, your ability to navigate change is also much more profound, which we'll, we'll talk about. Um, so this shows the, the, the good paying jobs um, are increasingly higher and higher levels of formal and technical learning. And I want to talk about bringing those two things together. But as recently as 25 years ago or so, 60% of the jobs that pay well, that's what these are, 60% of the jobs that pay well where you could, if you're on your own, uh, you had a decent income, if you had a family, this is used to calculate that, 60% could be had below a bachelor's degree. You see it's, it's almost flipped in the last 25 years. Now only 45% of good paying jobs that you can raise a family on uh, require less than a bachelor's degree and 55% require a bachelor's degree or higher. That's not, there are good jobs in that middle range, but you know, the, the range is moving, as you can tell. And so here's one of the features of our state. If we want more of our people, if we want 60% of our people to get a post-secondary credential or degree, um, the largest number of people, we have fewer K-12 age populations, are these adults who are already out there in the labor market. We have one of the highest rates in the country of folks who are already in the labor market without a valuable post-secondary credential or degree. 20% um, have some experience with post-secondary. Maybe they took a couple courses here when times were bad. Now they're, they went back to work. Um, one of the highest rates in the nation. We have even more people with just a high school diploma uh, than most states. And that's you know, a function of our manufacturing historic economy. You didn't need that. You could go in and out. Uh, good times, you're working. Bad times, maybe I'll go to community college and learn something else. Oh, well, forget about that. That era is gone, as you know. Um, so you can see, relative to the rest of the nation, the share of some post-secondary experience, but no credential, which, you know, if you don't have that credential, it's a, it's a proxy for what employers value. You, you, you can't find that new job. Um, 
Here's Oceana County, Nuega County, Muskegon County, the share of adults. Look at the number of Muskegon County. It's even higher than our state average. Um, so, you know, this region's employment, you know, workforce, labor market history, as you can see, has even more of these adults out there. So this is a big target for us if we want to, and I know it's the work of community colleges principally, more than our public universities, though increasingly the public universities need to get better at working with returning adults who are, you know, out in life already, not just kids emerging from high school. And here's um, another big issue for us. Over 20 years of cutting operating support for universities and colleges and cutting financial aid, relatively speaking, we now have priced higher education out of reach of many working families. We have the highest rate in the country, one of them, six highest in the U.S., worst in the Midwest, of the share of your money as a family or individual that you have to pay for tuition. Uh, it used to be that we all as a state came together through taxes, you know, businesses, corporate, individuals, and we subsidized higher education at our universities and community colleges. It used to be that we together paid for 75% of the cost of going to even one of our great public universities. Uh, and the individual and family only paid 25%. That's flipped around. Now we're paying, the individuals and families are paying 75% at universities. Community colleges are always a low cost, better option, but you know, we have not uh, subsidized higher education attainment as we used to. And it, as you know, people, many people, particularly first time college goers, as you all know, they don't think they can afford to go to a university. Uh, it's great if they start a community college, but they, they don't even get there. And that's the work of many of you in the LCANs. So this is a big challenge for us as a state. Um, and this is represented, we're, thir we're 40th in the nation in the amount of need-based financial aid based on need that we package for higher education learners. Um, that's not helping us move that needle in terms of higher education and post-secondary credential attainment. Uh, and again, the combination of cutting operating support for universities in particular uh, and cutting need-based financial aid, which we have over you know, 15 or 20 years, relatively speaking, it's come up a little bit in the last couple years, but it's nowhere near getting expected. Those two things together have flipped the switch on who's having to pay for higher education. It's now not all of us helping everybody get a great education, it's you, you know, and the debt burdens are huge. We have you know, one of the highest rates of debt burdens people take on. If you take on debt, um, if you earn a credential or degree, you usually can pay it off. If you take on debt and you don't earn a credential or degree, you're toast. And we're seeing more and more of that phenomenon and it's not helping our people. So the higher education we know drives attainment uh, and, and prosperity. Um, we know it's the path to a better life for our people. Uh, this is, you're gonna do better with a higher post-secondary degree or credential. Um, and it's really kind of good, better, best. You're much more likely to be employed and stay employed during a recession. You're, you're earning more money up until you get to the PhD level like Dr. Selman, because then you're, you're doing public service. You're working at a college or university <laughs> and you're sacrificing some of that massive wealth that you could earn uh, elsewhere. Um, and this is important to, to keep in mind. Um, we've had a lot of talk about the trades and, you know, hot jobs and with the skilled gaps that we face. Um, there are opportunities and needs in a variety of occupations. Um, but if you look at the ones, this is the first page of the state's list of the hot 50 jobs. These are the jobs that are um, hot, pay well and are growing fast. Uh, and you can see there's a couple of them that require, you know, on-the-job training. Uh, apprenticeship programs, but look at most all, 37 of the 50 hot jobs right now require a bachelor's degree or higher. You know, there's, there's accountants and there's commercial industrial designers and computer user support specialists. All of these require post-secondary credentials, often above a bachelor's degree. So even as we as a state are saying we need to prepare people for these jobs, more and more of them require a bachelor's degree or beyond, as well as certainly require an associate's or some post-secondary certificate that is valuable allows you to participate in the world. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Chris because what this is kind of making the case for 
we need more people with the skills and the credentials that are proxies for those skills to participate in, but also navigate a fast-changing labor market. And I, I guess I want to um, tell you know one story. We need everybody needs the generalizable skills that are so critical today: the ability to work in teams, the ability to communicate, the ability uh, to project manage. Uh, these are increasingly important, and they need the specialized skills in whatever they're doing that are demanded in their particular job. But we got to put those two and two together uh, for everybody. Um, we, we're not preparing people for a job for their lifetime anymore. The job's going to change. You know, these hot 50 jobs, you know, if we, had, if we had had the same list up 20 years ago, you know, it would have travel agents. You know, oh, we got to prepare people. There's lots of, those are gone. So we got to prepare people to adapt to change. Now, Sergey Brin and the Google folks, you know, these are like serious techies. They thought um, their best, highest contributing employees would be you know, people like them. They'd be the STEM grads. You know, they'd be the, the techies. So they did one of their rigorous you know, internal algorithm analysis, like who's producing more value in our, our company? And it totally blew them away. And this was only like a year and a half ago. Because the skills that they found were most valuable and, and that led to the highest value for the company where all these, what we used to call soft skills, which are nearly critical skills, it's people who can relate to other people well, appreciate people from diverse backgrounds, who are good mentors, who are good coaches, who are good listeners. And they change their algorithms for who they hire. So they're not just going for the techies, they're going for these liberal arts grads who have a different skill package. Now, you know, the ideal scenario, I think, is when you put two and two together, like, you know, we all have one of these. Um, who designed this phone? I mean, Steve Jobs, created something we didn't know we needed, and it's beautiful, right? And he's a serious techie, you know, it's computer science, but he was a liberal arts aesthetic who studied East Asian Sanskrit and, and uh, called himself an aesthete. He, he knows the key to this is the design and the look-feel. It's not all the hardware, well, that's important, you gotta get that right, I mean, it's, there's some innovative hardware, so putting those two things together, specialized skills that you gotta have, but with these broader design and, and aesthetics as well, can make something that's very valuable and put people to work and, and create jobs. And you know, we did the Cherry Commission 12 years ago. We are having this big debate about, should we like pay our colleges and universities more for you know, the widget makers of today that, you know, for reward them? Let's not subsidize. Let's, you know, let's have them uh, get more money for skilled trades training versus anthropologists and sociologists and you know, history majors. And this guy, Rick Rogers, who was president of the College of Creative Studies, who was on this group, and he said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Um, right then, the Chrysler 300, anybody remember the Chrysler 300? That was like a hot seller. It was putting people to work making and selling cars at Chrysler. Why? Because of its design. He says, you know who designed the Chrysler 300? It's an artist from my school. And that's why the thing's selling. So if you just, so that's, we didn't, we didn't change the way we fund colleges and universities to devalue arts. But we got to keep that thinking in mind. So Chris is going to show you some of the performance of how our state's doing, but also your, your local communities on what we call kind of metrics that matter. Because they matter if we move them towards ultimately post-secondary credential attainment. Um, I'm excited to be here today to kind of share with you a uh, continuation of the data that, um, that John shared. So how many of you know that uh, what our goal is? So if we're currently at just under 44%, should we be? By what year? 2025, that's right. So that's kind of our North Star for both the state of Michigan as well as the entire United States. So here in Michigan, if we um, look at the, the data broken out by um, race and ethnicity, you can see that um, we still are very much lagging so you can see we still have a lot of work to do as it relates to um, our diverse populations. So one of MCAN's commitments is that we need to better serve first generation, low income students and students of color because again, they continually lag and you're gonna see the data for both the state as well as for this region. Um, the other thing, and I realize this text is really small, we're not trying to, this is not an eye test this morning, 
But um, this is Michigan's degree attainment rate broken out by the SEAC or Michigan Works Regions. And I highlighted just the two and I'll read these numbers to you. So you can see that for West Michigan, they're ranked the fourth and that's where Muskegon uh, County falls. Um, but yet, if you go all the way down to number 14, the West Central Michigan area, that includes Nuego and Oceana counties. Um, so you can see that the attainment rate, typically where you have uh, more uh, higher ed institutions, you're gonna have a higher attainment rate. Um, obviously, where you probably have also a larger um, you know, population um, living. But you can see that, especially for these SEAC regions that are on the lower, you know, the lower tier, we have a lot of work to do to go from 20% to 60%, um, you know, in this, in this time frame. So when we talk about uh, college completion, we also have to think about college readiness. And here's where we've got data broken out uh, for this region specifically. So we use the SAT scores to determine uh, college readiness. Um, so you can see in Michigan, the average score is just over 1,000, um, followed by Nuego County, uh, Risa, which is at 972, Muskegon, I'm sorry, then Oceana at nine, just below 957, and then Muskegon area ISD is at 949. So again, all parts of this region are lagging behind the state average, which again, there's still work to do to get our students to be college ready. And here's the percent, so if you look at it by the score, this is the percent who are ready. So again, um, statewide, we're only at 35%. Think about that, only 35% of our SAT test takers are demonstrating that they're at the benchmark to be ready for college. And then we wonder why they struggle once they get into college. So again, this is a reminder that we still have work to do in our K through 12 system and then again, look how far below this region is compared to that state level. Again, some of you might be surprised by this data. Those that are working in the college access, uh, local college access networks, this is data that's near and dear to your heart because these are the metrics that you're trying to change and influence. Um, if we look at college readiness by race and income, um, this is again for the entire state. Um, you can see that if you look at the second from the right bar, um, only 16% of students who are economically disadvantaged, which is typically free and reduced lunch, are college ready. So there's a direct connection here between what you have and where you can go uh, and where you're at. And look at, look at the pitiful 9% African American college readiness rate for our state, right? We have a long way to go to change that gap. This is probably the number one um, focus that needs to happen in our state. We have to change this because, again, this is embarrassing um, for, our, um, for our state to only be 9% are ready to go. Um, so then if we look at, um, so unfortunately, because the data is too small to report for Nuega and Oceana counties, again, probably no surprise because there's not a lot of diversity in this region. So what we did was I pulled the data just for Muskegon Area ISD um, and you can see here that, again, your college readiness for African American, 2%. Um, economically disadvantaged, 13%. Um, the whole Muskegon um, average, again, is, is 23%. Um, you can see that your Asian and Pacific Islanders, again, pretty, pretty typical um, because we see that same um, similar um, that they're excelling in terms of being ready for college. So the other aspect of college readiness that we look at is remedial coursework. Again, probably no surprise here. Now this is an interesting discovery here. So if you notice for the state, it's 27%. So again, 27% of students who go to, who enter our schools here in Michigan have to take at least one remedial course. Again, a reminder that they're not prepared for college level work. Now, what's fascinating, and I'm not sure if this, uh, we presume this data is accurate, but the fact that uh, both Muskegon and Nuega are, are way less than that. Um, here's, um, we, we ran it for multiple years, and there must have been, maybe some of you know about this, 
uh, more than I do, but something happened in this region between 2011 and 2012. I don't know if you changed your placement policy for remedial coursework, but to go from that 27% to then down to 10 and then continually going down, does anybody know anything about, about this? Because th th there's either an excl explanation for a change in, in protocol or policy, or we discovered a data error in CEPI. And I don't know which is true because I wanted to wait to see if you had some working knowledge of this because the fact that you're so much lower is we don't typically see this. Anybody have any insights about that? Yeah, right. I mean, kudos if this is really accurate. Um, but again, I would also want to know what, there, something happened a few years ago. So, all right, I'll, I'll, I'm going to follow up with CEPI to just find out if the data file is really correct. We presume it is, um, but it was just fascinating that we saw such, such a big difference. <laughs> so if you look at um, college readiness, again, for the entire state, um, and we're only looking at remedial coursework, again, 52% of African Americans <laughs> are in remedial coursework. If you're from an economically disadvantaged background, 41%. Um, and again, if you're Hispanic or Latino, 39%. Again, compared to the white population, 23%. Asian population, um, 18%. For Muskegon, so again, going back, so African American for the state is actually 52%. Interesting that uh, Muskegon, for African American, it's actually only 19%. Um, uh, but again, your average is only 5.5%, which again is commendable. Um, so again, there's either work being done to make sure that, that's the, that students aren't going into remedial coursework. Um, but I wanted to share with you, uh, again, what we had for Muskegon. Now, the one bright light, the glimmer of hope in our state is our FAFSA completion rate is at 57.9%. And this gives you, I realize you can't read all of the numbers um, on here, but uh, this is a huge uh, push. Uh, right now, we're in the midst of our college uh, cash campaign, which is designed to encourage high schools to push to have every high school senior complete the FAFSA, uh, because we know that um, that paying for college is one of the biggest concerns. And if students know that they might be eligible for a Pell Grant um, or eligible for other funding, that it makes college possible. Um, here is your share of seniors who are completing the FAFSA. So in Michigan, we're at that 57.9. But kudos to all three of your counties for being above the state average. Um, this is something that you should be proud of. Obviously, our goal is to get to 75% or higher, so um, your counties are well on track um, to hit that. And again, your local college access networks, this is on their radar um, and are, are pushing to, to move students to complete the FAFSA, which now can be done on your mobile phone. Back to John's comment about the smartphone. For the first time in the history of the FAFSA, students can file it from their smartphone. Progress, right? Um, so the other factor that we look at is what is the college enrollment rate um, coming out of high school? And so this looks at the class of 2016. It looks at how many were enrolled within 12 months of graduating from high school, including two-year, four-year, public, private, in-state, out-of-state. Um, so you can see for Michigan, it's 68%, but all of the um, counties or school districts in this region are below that, especially Nuego being only at 51%. Um, so again, we want to get as many students um, enrolling and continuing on a post-secondary uh, credential route. If you look at the college enrollment rate broken out by race and ethnicity, um, you can see that again, the lowest um, enrollment rate are those from economically disadvantaged backgrounds. So again, this is a population that typically doesn't think that they can afford to go to college or they don't come, they might be first generation um, as well. Um, so, and you can see that the other uh, rates for the other races, again, are all below, um, you know, the all student uh, count with Asia, the Asian population, again, as we see here, continuing to lead. 
For Muskegon, so if I just flip back, you can see that um, your numbers are um, obviously going to be lower for um, actually all of the populations, with the exception of um, your white students um, are higher than your entire um, uh, area. For Nuego County, um, there's, not an, there's not data available for three of the categories, but um, you know, again, you're at 45% for economically disadvantaged and only 49% for Hispanic and Latino. And then Oceana County um, is actually doing um, a little bit better if you take a look at um, Hispanic, 62% actually doing one percentage point higher than your entire um, county. The other thing I just wanted to share with you that you may or may not know, of, know about, um, every year the Michigan College Access Network puts together college access profiles. It's one per legislative district. Um, and they're available on our website. And I'm just get, kind of giving you a, a quick screenshot. Um, this is Senate District 34 for Nuego, But it allows us to communicate some of those stats that we shared with you um, on the bottom. It's uh, Nuego's rates compared to the state rates. And then above that is all of the information about what we are doing um, related to increasing college access, whether it be a, a local college access network, if we have trained school counselors in the area, if we have college advisors, um, if we've given grants. Um, so we share this every year with your legislators to remind them of these metrics, but also to remind them of the efforts that are going on to change these metrics. So I'm going to turn it over to John. Uh, that kind of concludes the, the data sharing portion to kind of give you a sense. And we're going to talk about what actions. So we have all this information. What do we need to do with it in order to, to get to goal 2025? I guess since you're recording, you want to keep uh, that opportunity. Um, and in a minute, at the end, I'll show you there's, there's a website where the full total talent report and a lot of the other information you're seeing is available. Um, and we'll make sure you get the, the PowerPoint as well so that you have all that. Um, but as we put, again, this kind of blueprint together uh, just in this last year with our business leaders, our higher education leaders about what's the agenda as we move from one administration to the other. And we are uh, definitely pushing and working with the incoming governor. And we really need to push the legislature to understand, here's what we need to do if we're going to meet uh, our talent goal and help more of our people get the skills and credentials they need to be successful. So the main headlines of that are, look, we have to create, uh, uh, we have to make college and post-secondary education affordable. We need to package some sort of uh, financial aid, need-based guarantee. And I, I'm happy, I think the incoming governor has promised as much. Uh, that's going to make uh, post-secondary education within reach of both youth and adults. And those are the, the two biggest recommendations. We have to make it affordable for more of our people so they earn a post-secondary credential. And we, we also need to focus a lot of that effort on the adults who are already in the labor market, where if we're going to move the needle on our overall attainment levels as a state, we need to make some headway. Um, we, we certainly want to continue and enhance how we support the regional uh, career path, skill building pathways that you all and others are involved in. Um, and we, 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 we've slightly reversed, but it actually isn't even keeping up with inflation now, um, our just operating support for universities and community colleges. Um, so we need to keep that above the rate of inflation if we're going to make up ground. And that contributes to both affordability but also, you know, th these institutions cost money to operate in your programs, uh, facilities, uh, and faculty. So we need to provide a, a, a rich learning environment that uh, supports excellent education uh, if we're serious about this as a state. Um, we have to stay the course on some of these high yield strategies and efforts that are going on with our stakeholders, our K-12 institutions, our community colleges, our universities. Uh, we need to enhance dramatically the number of guide, college and career guidance counselors in our high schools in particular uh, so that we, more kids can get that support and find their path to that next step. Uh, that's a big recommendation. We need to continue to improve the transfer and acceptance and alignment and efficiency of movement within higher ed and extend that to K-12. So our rigorous courses are accepted at community colleges and universities. Uh, community colleges coursework is accepted as a package at, in more disciplines at uh, bachelor's and beyond 
uh, degree again in grant institutions. We need to enhance, you know, dramatically the number of young people who are participating in some form of powerful early post-secondary learning and credit earning. Uh, it's one of the best strategies to help at-risk kids uh, and high-flyer kids get a post-secondary credential and, and even get in a different context. Do you have an early college or, or can you do one right here? I mean, they, they work. <laughs> they powerfully engage students and get them uh, earning uh, and learning beyond high school fast. That saves money and, and it gets them to that post-secondary credential that they need. And our institutions that are working on how to guide, mentor, support, you know, whatever it takes to help people who show up here uh, complete a credential or degree. Uh, important institutional success strategies. Um, so we are saying, you know, what do you all do? What do we hope you will do? Uh, I know, you know, you're, you're, you're crosswalked in the SEAC regions, but you're part of Talent 2025, which is the business-led effort to really focus on this agenda. So we want you to continue to participate in and help organize your talent stakeholders, your employers, your education institutions, your workforce development, and the helping organizations like ELCANS to come together, work together, use this information, use what you know about your local labor market and the performance, you know, differential performance for different types of people and really focus on that. What are we doing? How are we doing? But then what are we doing? So you can identify your own priorities and move them to close those gaps that Chris was illustrating, uh, to focus effort where it's needed, to organize around some of the high yield strategies that I know you're already involved with that can contribute to post-secondary credential earning. Uh, and, and work on those together and collaborate at the regional and local level uh, as we're trying to encourage that kind of collaboration at the state level. There's a talent summit where we're principally trying to hit the incoming legislators who don't know this terrain uh, with, here, if we got to get more serious about talent building, here's the, here's the case that we just presented to you of why it's so important. Here's the particular strategies, policies, budget implications that we need to make. So are these folks all invited? We invite the SEAC folks, but I'm sure if you want to come, we can we can wangle you an invitation. Um, so that's that's trying to hit our lawmakers and our um, and we're having a lot of the business leaders from around the state kind of help make the case at that for this agenda. Um, this is how to contact us. And do you have here's the website where you can get the the full report that this is really a summary of um, the executive summary. Uh, the more information about um, this agenda, the particular presentation will have to get to you directly because it's got that local data to the degree that that's helpful for you. So, sorry we talked a lot, but we have a few more minutes, I'm sure. So, questions, speeches, other things people would like to share or ask about. And actually, first I want to recognize the uh, LCAN coordinators that we have here for the important work that they're doing. They can please stand and be recognized. Yeah. Keep them very busy and on task to uh, to move the needle on those metrics. So. Questions or comments? Just a quick question. Because of the college degrees and credentials and everything, have you guys looked at jobs by county that don't need college degrees? Because seeing the data is like, okay, we don't have students that don't have them. But then we have all these back, like we have the welding, we have this industry here in Muskegon that a lot of students coming out of high school are just getting these jobs in the factory and then moving their way up. Have we looked at, even though they're being successful, the, the number of jobs that don't need that right now? Just to kind of play devil's advocate to all the negative, <laughs> the negativeness. And, and do you know that the state has been trying to promote that there are a lot of those jobs that are below a bachelor's degree and above right. a high school degree? I think that's what you need to do if you're not doing it already in the context of your regional um, you know, labor market and workforce planning entities like Town 2025, like your CX. That information is available. You gotta look at it and, and say, okay, what does this tell us? In our region, we do have more opportunities at this level. Are we building the programs that match that? I mean, that's, uh, that's really the kind of the first step is to look at your own, because labor markets and occupational mixes and employers and what they demand are very different. You know, I'm in Ann Arbor. It's a whole different world than it is, you know, up in Marquette. So the local regional labor market has got to be the place we look at. Who are our employers? 
what are the jobs that they need, which ones can they fill, and orient your preparation systems working together, community college workforce, the career technical folks, towards how do we meet this need, and with keeping in, in mind that the, the skill demands and preparation needed are just ratcheting up generally, but it's gonna be different in different places. I mean, these right. education attainment, post secondary credential attainment, for, for good reason, is lower in a historically manufacturing community than it is in a different type of community. I think, to your point, a couple of things. Um, number one, you know, that can, when we say that everybody should go to college, we are inclusive of that, those programs because it is post-secondary education, so anything beyond high school um, is, is important. Uh, and this one point we didn't emphasize is we should. Um, we have to end this war or debate between CTE versus college. We need more at all levels of post-secondary credentialing and earning from master's degrees to professional degrees to, and we, we've mapped this out, um, just based on what is demanded today. And technical degrees and certificates below an associate, we need more of everything. Uh, and it's got to map you know, where those opportunities are, but also remember the, the Google story. Um, you're more likely to be one who's navigating and creating your own opportunity if you have higher levels of formal occupation because the occupations are going to change. And the top 50 list is going to be a different list next year or tomorrow. So building the skills to adapt to change means higher levels of formal learning and bringing those critical skills plus specializing whatever you're doing today, that's going to change tomorrow. The other thing that MCAN is doing right now, we just actually uh, did a video shoot on Wednesday at uh, the other community college that campus I was on, but we're doing a uh, project <laughs> called uh, Stackable Credentials. And so what we're doing is we, we're showcasing a carpentry program, and what we're doing is we're showcasing how you can start and get the, the certificate, how you can then proceed on and get an associate, you can then continue on and get a bachelor's in construction management, you could go on and get a master's, let's say an MBA, if you decide you want to own your own construction. So we're trying to show the, these pathways and these options and to, to communicate the message, uh, start here, but think about your future and think about where you could go with this. And we're using the top 50 jobs and jobs that pay a living wage to drive that. And so we're, we are going to do probably an initial 10 community college programs that offer a certificate and map it out. Um, not that we don't already do this, but we're going to try to raise the visibility with video and a two-pager um, to bring attention to that option. Um, and that's really a, another, the, the education system that we need is not terminal credentials for an occupation that lasts a lifetime. It's supporting open-ended pathways where you get something, you get it, oh, now I need this and I can go here. I was just going to point out one of the things that we're trying to do at the LCAN for um, Muskegon County is very much on the vein of stackable, but we are really, obviously our college enrollment rates are um, a little dismal, and that's right out of the gate, that's right out of high school, and so we start to see our enrollment trends increase as the student gets older, as they get into the workforce, and now their job is saying, hey, we would really like you to get this credential. And so as an older adult, they might be coming into the workforce. So what we're trying to do as an Alcan is to map that industry out for our kiddos in high school so that they know um, what industries, what organizations, and what businesses offer <coughs> programs like reimbursement for college courses, right? Things of that nature, and those programs that are needed for an associate's degree, et cetera. They may not be ready for college now, as a 17, 18 year old, but they need to be thinking about their future and what that looks like. And so we really just want to give them the tools um, to make those good decisions. And our businesses are on board because they know that they need degrees as well. And so we're just really trying to think outside the box on how can we help that. Those of you from the Muskegon area, you know, probably have heard about Muskegon Made. Our Muskegon Made, our career development initiative, is behind that research for our students. So we're really trying to make sure that they have information armed to them. Um, 
if they're not quite ready to make that leap right out the gate. Sure. I'm going to go back to your other, your, your, your comment and question. So I'm going to ask the question here. How many of you have a dog? <laughs> I know it seems kind of crazy. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, because uh, one of my colleagues at MCAN just shared in a post yesterday in social media that said uh, it was 10 uh, jobs that you can do, you can make up over $100,000 without a bachelor's degree, and if one of them was dog walker. Um, so I'm not going to out the people who have the dog walker, but um, I think, you know, this is, again, a job that. Well, it may have existed, you would have paid the neighbor kid to walk your dog, but there are people who are now professional dog walkers who make a ton of money because those who are working full time. So, and, and I just use that, that's a kind of a weird, crazy, crazy one, but there are always going to be those opportunities. And somebody, obviously, or many people are um, doing very well. Um, now, I think they should still go on and continue their education um, to make sure they are. Best, the best dog walker in the business. <laughs> but but to, to start a dog walking business, right, you need to understand how to run a business, right? Especially if you have people working for you. Yeah. I mean, you laugh, this is big business for people that have dogs. Right? Um, all right, I want, want, I want to be respectful of time, so I think what we'll do is, for those that need to leave, we'll go ahead and, and let you uh, Leave, but then those that still have some questions, if you want to stay, we'll stay for a few more minutes. But I want to be respectful of your time. So thank so you. Folks, so really quick, your last time down.